today, I'm making a fun brunch meant for having people over on the weekends with chicken chilequiles. I'm gonna serve that with the classic beer drink, the michelada and some homemade hot sauce. We're gonna top it off with a fried ice cream cake with flavors that represent Mexican fried ice cream. So to get started, we're gonna make the brownie that goes in the base of the ice cream cake. And this is just a standard easy brownie. So here I have three ounces of unsweetened chocolate that I've chopped. We're gonna melt it with a stick of unsalted butter. Now you could easily do this in the microwave. 50% power, takes a couple minutes. I'm just gonna do it on the stove top because it's easier for me. So if you were to melt this in the microwave, you'd use 50% power, but here on the stove, I'm just using low heat and I'm stirring it constantly until the butter and the chocolate are completely melted. All right, that looks pretty good. You can see the mixture is nice and melted, super smooth. Now I'm just gonna set this aside, let it cool for a few minutes while we get the rest of the brownie batter together. So here I have a cup of sugar. To this, we're gonna add two large eggs. I'm gonna add a teaspoon of vanilla extract. I'm gonna add half a teaspoon of baking powder and a quarter teaspoon of table salt. Now we're just gonna whisk this together, break up the eggs, start to dissolve the sugar a bit before we add the chocolate and the flour. All right, in goes the cooled chocolate and last the flour. Now this is all purpose flour, it's just two thirds of a cup. There we go. You wanna stir that in. Yeah, I know I'm stirring with a whisk. I like stirring with whisks. I feel like it's just more efficient. You wanna make sure there's no more streaks of flour. A few lumps are okay. Those lumps will bake out. You just don't wanna see any raw flour. All right, so this batter is ready for the pan. And here I have an eight inch cake pan that you can see is well prepped. So I greased it. I put a parchment paper around on the bottom, greased it again, and then floured because you really wanna make sure the brownie comes out of the pan. Believe it or not, we're gonna build the ice cream cake in a bigger pan. This is just the base. Into the pan it goes. I have to say this batter tastes really good too. So I'll leave a little in the bowl for the dishwasher, which is me. All right, level it out a bit. Slapping it on the counter, not only fun, but it also releases any air bubbles that are lodged in the batter. So you get a nice smooth cake or brownie. Always a good trick whenever you're baking. Into a 350 degree oven for about 25 minutes. You know it's done when a toothpick insert partway between the center and the edge comes out clean. It's time to make the ice cream cake. So here's the brownie that we baked earlier. Now I let it cool in the pan for about an hour and then I turned it out of the pan and let it cool completely for an hour and a half. So it's not gonna melt the ice cream because there's no residual heat left in it. All right, for the ice cream cake, we're gonna use a spring form pan. That makes it easier to serve because you can just spring the sides off when it's serving time. I'm gonna put the brownie right in the center. Now this is a nine inch spring form pan. And remember we baked the brownie in an eight inch pan. So it sits right in the middle. That means the sides are gonna be all ice cream. So we'll set this aside. And here we have dun -dun -dun, the ice cream. So we're gonna make a flavored ice cream that kind of represents the flavors of Mexican fried ice cream. So this is three pints of good vanilla ice cream. We're gonna flavor it with a little cinnamon, teaspoon of cinnamon. The recipe calls for a cup and a third of toffee bits, which is actually just one bag. All right, now we're just gonna mix this together. Now, tools of choice for making flavored ice cream is the super stiff spatula that I think was a freebie. It came with one of the appliances and a wooden spoon. So I'm gonna take the ice cream and sort of chop it up with this stiff spatula and start to really mix the ingredients together. I think there's an ice cream store that does this to order on big marble slabs. If you're kind of doing that yourself, also wanna point out, it is a nice big bowl. Don't limit yourself here and try to use a bowl that's just the right size because you'll make a mess. All right. Just don't want any big lumps of vanilla. I think I see one in the bottom there. Oh, I could dive into this bowl. It looks so good. All right, saving it for the cake, saving it for the cake. Into the pan it goes. Now the trick is to get it on the sides around the brownie. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the sides first get the ice cream all on the sides, press it down in there. And the brownie at this point is pretty durable. It can withstand a lot. And also it's hidden underneath the ice cream. So you don't have to be too gentle. Now the rest of the ice cream just goes on top. Oh, it smells good. 
And it's a dessert that kids love. In fact, if there's ever any leftover, my daughter, she'll run to the freezer and just keep slicing it off after school as an after school snack. All right, we're just gonna smooth the top, make sure it's nice and level. It's gonna get covered with chocolate syrup, so the texture of the top, not super important. All right, time to get this ice cream back in the freezer, covering it with plastic wrap. Now you need to freeze this until it's completely solid. It takes at least four hours, but you can easily do this a couple days ahead of time. Want more stories and recipes from Cook's Country for free? Then sign up for the Cook's Country email newsletter. Our free newsletter takes you behind the scenes with the people and the recipes changing the way America cooks. Get exclusive tips, seasonal recipes, product reviews, and more delivered straight to your inbox. Visit cookscountry.com and sign up for free. That ice cream cake is firming up in the freezer and now we're gonna make a crunchy coating that we're gonna pack on the outside of the cake that really replicates what you get when you get fried ice cream. You know, it has that covering of that crisp cinnamon flavor and we're gonna use cinnamon toast crunch. Yep, the cereal, because it has the perfect crisp texture and cinnamon flavor. So here we have a cup of cinnamon toast crunch. We're gonna grind it into crumbs in the food processor. There we go. All right, you want pretty even fine crumbs. Now we're gonna toast this cereal in a little browned butter. So here I have a tablespoon of unsalted butter. I'm gonna brown it in a small skillet on the stove. This is a great time to pull out a traditional skillet, you know, one with a silver color because you can see the butter brown. But I don't have one in this size, so I'm just gonna have to be extra careful to note the color of the butter against the dark pan surface. Now the butter is just starting to brown, really hard to see against the dark surface of this skillet, but you can smell it, almost smell it's like toasted nuts. And that's perfect. You can see when it pools a little bit, you can see it's a little bit browner than usual. The smell is something else. All right, so into the pan go all the crumbs. We're just gonna toast these crumbs for about a minute until they get lightly golden. All right. That's pretty good. You can smell the difference. You can see they're not much darker in color, just a little bit more golden, but they smell toasted and warm. All right, so now we're just gonna spread these out onto from a baking sheet or a plate. You just wanna let them cool. That way they'll be ready to put on the outside of the ice cream cake just before serving. It's time to make the chilequiles. Now chilequiles consist of tortillas, corn tortillas. Now they're either fried or baked and then they're added to a homemade chili sauce made with a bunch of chilies, guajillos are most traditional, with some fresh chilies too, some poblanos and jalapenos. And you serve it for brunch. Sometimes you throw eggs on it. Today we're making chicken chilaquiles, which are my personal favorite. So we're gonna get started with the corn tortillas. So these are little corn tortillas. I got 16 of them. And we're gonna cut them into chips. Now I've seen recipes that just call for tortilla chips or baked tortilla chips. They just taste stale to me. The good tortillas are the highlight of this recipe. So buy them fresh, toast them yourself. So I'm just cutting them into wedges that replicate tortilla chips. Now we're going to toast them in a hot oven over two baking sheets. I'll put half on one, the others on the other. All right, now we're going to drizzle them with a little bit of oil. We want about two tablespoons of vegetable oil per tray. All right, and we're gonna have some salt to each tray as well. Toss them around, make sure they're nice and evenly coated. Then you just wanna spread them out so they toast evenly. And they take about 20 minutes or so in the oven. Two trays, two oven racks, upper and lower middle rack. And you're gonna switch and rotate the trays halfway through. And I have to say from much experience, these tortillas go from raw to burned in a nanosecond. So you can walk away for the first few minutes, but then make sure you're back at the stove watching them toast for the last minute or two. All right, spread them out as good as you can into a 425 degree oven. Again, that takes about 20 minutes. Okay, while those tortillas are crisping up in the oven, it's time to make the sauce. So the base of this sauce is gonna be guajillo chilies. Now these are dried chilies. They have a lovely flavor. They're not very spicy, sort of sun-dried tomatoes, a little raisiny. And when you buy them, they're usually sold in bags like this. You wanna look for chilies that are flexible. 
Let me show you what I mean. See how these are nice and flexible? If you find them and they're very brittle, it just means they're old and they're not gonna have as much flavor. So we're gonna need five of these chilies. This guy's a little on the small side, so I'm gonna use two for him. All right, so to get these chilies ready for the sauce, we're gonna take the stems out just by ripping them off. Shake out the seeds. You can kind of tear up the side of the chili, see if there's any seeds hiding in the very tip. And then we're just gonna tear it into big pieces. Eventually the sauce is going in the blender, so you don't have to be precise here. Now, if you can't find Guajillo chilies, you could substitute New Mexican or even Anaheim dried chilies, but the Guajillo are just perfect here. They're rounder, sort of that sun-dried tomato flavor, as I mentioned. It's really good in the sauce. Now, if you're sensitive to chilies, don't be afraid to wear gloves to do this. Now, these chilies aren't spicy, but there is a little capsaicin, and it could bother your skin if you're sensitive. I'm sort of impervious to capsaicin and hot chilies at this point, so I don't need them. And in fact, when you get in the habit of toasting your own chilies like this, it's a great way if you're making chili or anything that calls for chili powder, because essentially we're making our own guajillo chili powder here. And when you use good dried chilies, it just adds a depth of flavor that you can't get from a pre-ground powder. Last chili here. Some seeds are okay. Few always seem to make it in the sauce. Before we grind these chilies into a powder, we're gonna toast them in the skillet. Medium heat takes about five or so minutes and they're gonna get really fragrant and brittle. Just gonna add them right to a dry skillet. Medium heat, again, this takes around five minutes. They're gonna get brittle and you're really gonna smell them. Especially if you start to cough or sneeze, that is a good sign that the chilies are nicely toasted. Oh, and when you start to see smoke, you see that little bit of smoke starting to come out of the pan. That's a good sign, time to turn the pan down and you just don't have much longer to go, maybe about 30 seconds. And this is what I meant by if you're coughing or sneezing, because this is where you get the aroma. I've been known to start sneezing right about now. So once you start sneezing, about 30 seconds. Mmm, the smell is wonderful though. That's the great thing about cast iron. You can really heat it up over fairly high heat, get it good and hot, and the surface can really handle it. Sometimes you can even draw in the residue that's left. Hello, a little buddy for later. All right, these chilies are ready to be ground into a powder. So into the blender the chilies go, and actually we're gonna build the whole sauce in the blender. Just gonna start with these dried chilies, get them ground up first. And if you've never done this, it's really quite fun. I didn't start making my own chili powder until I started working at America's Test Kitchen. We started doing it about 15 years ago. It is a game changer. It's incredibly easy, and that's how you get really authentic tasting Mexican food. All right, so here we're gonna grind these up. You can see how nice and dry they are. They grind up really nicely. fun, isn't it? This whole recipe is fun. All right. You can see that lovely powder. Now we're going to start to add the other ingredients to turn it into a sauce. So this is the dried chilies. Now we're going to add some fresh chilies. This is one chopped jalapeno and one chopped poblano. Now the jalapeno obviously has some heat. The poblano just adds some good green grassy flavor and some bulk. That was one of each. We're going to add three quarters of a cup of chopped onion three cloves of garlic that we already chopped up. We're gonna add some fresh cilantro. So this is eight sprigs of cilantro. Stems are welcome in this sauce. They have a lovely sweet flavor. Just wanna give it a rough chop before you put it into the blender. There we go, into the blender it goes. And last, we're gonna add some tomatoes. This is a big old can, 28 ounce can of peeled tomatoes with their juice. It all goes right into the blender. All right. Last, we're gonna add some salt. We need three quarters of a teaspoon of salt. There we go. Now we're just gonna blend it till it's nice and smooth and makes a lovely chili sauce. All right, let's take a look. Now, depending on your blender, it could take anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute and a half. What you really want is a super smooth sauce. Yeah, just like that. Nice and smooth, no big chunks of anything left. All right, so we're gonna make sure I get all that chili powder. There's a little bit stuck in this lid here. I wanna make it all into the sauce. All right, gonna put this back into the pan, the same pan that we used to toast the chilies. Oh, you can see that pan is still hot, left over from the toasted chilies. Already starting to cook the sauce. You can smell the fresh chilies and those toasted guajillos. Oh, delicious. 
To this, we're gonna add one and a half cups of chicken broth. Now we're gonna bring this to a simmer because I mentioned we're making chicken chilaquiles and I'm actually gonna post the chicken right in the sauce. So here is the chicken that's ready to be poached in the sauce. Now it's pound and a half of chicken breasts. And over the years, I found that people really like chicken breasts in this recipe, but chicken thighs would also work as long as you use a pound and a half. Now the thing about boneless chicken breasts is they're really thick on one end and thin on the other. So if you want them to cook at the same rate, especially in the sauce, you just wanna give the thick end a quick pound. All right, our sauce is at a simmer. Time to slip the chicken in. All right, now these will need to cook how about 15 minutes. You're looking for an internal temperature on the chicken to be about 160. I'm gonna lower the heat. You just want a bare simmer here. We're gonna put the lid on, let it cook under the cover. Now halfway through, I am gonna flip the chicken over just to make sure it cooks evenly. All right, the chicken has been cooking for a little bit here. Time to take its temperature. Again, we're looking for 160. Perfect. All right, so taking it out of the sauce, we're gonna let it cool a little bit before we shred it. Now I'm gonna to continue to simmer the sauce because you want it to thicken up a little bit. It should measure around four cups before you add the tortillas. Okay, so the sauce is simmering, the chicken is cooling. It is time to make a michelada, which is a Mexican drink based on Mexican beer, which I have here. But we're gonna flavor it with some lime juice, a little chili, a little hot sauce. So here's how you make it. I have a cup of fresh lime juice here. To this, we're gonna add some hot sauce. Woo, hot sauce is ready to go. Now this is the homemade hot sauce. Of course you could use store-bought hot sauce. Now you want eight teaspoons, which is a teaspoon shy of three tablespoons. There are three teaspoons in a tablespoon. So, whoo, this is a tablespoon measure. I'm just gonna do a little shy on this last one. Oh. Two tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce and a little bit of salt. Now you wanna mix this up. Great use for a nice long cooking chopstick. All right, whoo. This is just fun, you don't have to do this, but we're gonna make a rim on the glass with some salt, and this is just salt and chili powder that have mixed together. So to get that to stick, I'm gonna run a lime around the rim of the glass that just gets it wet. You take the glass, spin it in the salt and chili powder. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna put some ice in the glass. I strongly recommend you make this drink before you shred chicken. Shredding chicken takes forever and it's kind of, it's kind of my least favorite task in the kitchen. So this makes it go down a little easier. Now for one beer, you want about a quarter cup of this or two ounces of this mixture into the glass it goes. Now for the beer, you have to use a Mexican beer. Okay, you don't have to, but it tastes good with a nice mild Mexican beer like Tecate. This, uh, <laughs> this is Ian's can opener, I think. It's seen a long life. It's his favorite, it has a mermaid on it, but it doesn't work so well anymore because I think we've used it too much. In goes the beer, garnished with a lime. <laughs> and this is a michelada. Mm. The beer with the hot sauce, that little bit of Worcestershire. It is a refreshing way to have beer, especially on a hot day. All right. Now with our michelada in hand, time to shred the chicken. And remember I put the chicken in a bowl to contain the juices. This juice is gonna go back into the sauce. All right, so back to the chicken using two forks. Just wanna start shredding the meat. I like some biggish chunks. I don't like it too finely shredded. So I like to be able to taste the chicken around the pieces of tortilla in the sauce. Now, if you're doing this and you're having people over, you can easily make the sauce and shred this chicken ahead of time. You just store them separately and then you bring the sauce back to a simmer before you add the chicken and you're ready to go. All right, so this chicken goes back into the simmering sauce. We're gonna let it heat up for a few minutes. All right. All right, we're gonna let that chicken heat through for just a minute or two. And now here are the tortilla chips that I toasted in the oven, let them cool. You can see they get a variety of colors and that's okay. Sometimes I like these dark ones. I think it adds a nice deeper flavor, but the range of colors is fine. You just wanna make sure that they're absolutely crisp. All right, so we're gonna stir these into the sauce. I'm just gonna let them sit in that sauce for about two minutes. But if you like a softer texture, you can leave them in there up to five minutes off heat under the lid. Oh, this is when you can start to get excited. So you really wanna make sure you stir them in completely. You wanna coat them all evenly with sauce. Lid goes on. You can let them sit. Now I'm just gonna clean up right before we eat. 
All right, just gonna finish prepping a few garnishes that go on top of the chile quiles. Some fresh cilantro is great. Oh, the smell is wonderful. I put cilantro on everything. Even if you think it shouldn't have cilantro on it, I put cilantro on it. It's something on the shopping list in my house every week. I was gonna cut up some fresh avocado. Ooh, that's a good one. Gotta be careful when you're doing this not to go through the skin of the avocado and cut your hand. I've done that before. All right, we'll scoop that right on top of the chilaquiles, which I think are perfectly done now. Oh. Mmm, oh, the smell, because now it smells like those corn tortillas that have mixed with that beautiful chili sauce. Now, garnishing this is half the fun. I actually like to serve it in a pretty cast iron dish because it gets all these garnishes. The avocado right on top. All right, we have some chopped white onion, just a little bit. Now, if you're scared of raw white onion, I don't blame you. I know a lot of people don't like it. Scallions would be good here, or you could give the onion a rinse. It gets rid of some of those harsher flavors. You wind up with a nice sweet flavor. So just a quarter cup of onion, some queso fresco, some sliced radishes, a little bit of chopped cilantro, and some lime wedges. And that's it. I know it didn't start out as a looker, but with all the garnishes, it really does come across. But the flavor of the chips and the sauce can't be beat. So to serve it, I have a little, you could have some Mexican crema or you could loosen up a little sour cream with lime juice is what I did here. And of course you have to serve chilequiles with some hot sauce. Now this is actually homemade hot sauce. The recipe is pretty easy, really quite fun. So if you'd like to make your own, start by putting six ounces of red jalapeno or Fresno chilies, one carrot, a shallot that you quartered, and six peeled cloves of garlic on a rim baking sheet. And you wanna broil that until the peppers are nice and blackened. And that takes about 10 minutes. Then put the jalapenos into a bowl, cover with plastic wrap, and let those skins steam until they loosen. That takes about another 10 minutes. Meanwhile, put the rest of those broiled vegetables into the jar of a blender and let them cool a bit. Once the skins on those steamed chilies have loosened, you wanna peel off as much as you can. Add them to the blender with some habaneros. Now the habaneros is where the heat comes from. It's two ounces of habaneros. Add one cup of distilled white vinegar, two tablespoons of brown sugar, and a tablespoon of salt, and blend the hot sauce until it's really nice and smooth. It takes about a minute. And then using a funnel, portion the hot sauce into two glass bottles. And you can use the hot sauce right away, but it will store in the fridge for up to three months. All right, let's dig in. Supposed to serve, you know, four, four to six people, or it serves me and Ian. We have definitely, on a hungry Sunday, housed nearly this whole thing. Mmm. It has a flavor that has the dried, sort of sun-dried tomato, but also the grassiness of the poblano and the tender chicken, and the texture of those tortillas are perfection. Perfect with the michelada. Now, what better way to wrap up a brunch like this than with that ice cream cake, which we have yet to finish. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this video. Did you know that you can stream every season of your favorite shows from America's Test Kitchen anywhere, anytime, and ad-free? With an all-access digital membership, you can unlock thousands of recipes that have been rigorously tested by our experts. Not to mention unbiased equipment and ingredient reviews available at home or on the go with our mobile app. Visit cookscountry.com to start your free trial. All right, it's time for the ice cream cake. Now this is well chilled, been in the freezer at least four hours, but if you can do it a day ahead, it'll be much firmer and easier to work with. So to release it from the outside of the spring form pan, just wanna run a paring knife around the outside. And depending on the kind of ice cream you use, it will be harder or softer. So if you have to keep returning this to the freezer to keep it nice and chilled, be sure to do that. And in general, I find the less expensive ice creams, not the premium ice creams, work a little better in this cake. They just set up better. All right, take the form off. All right, now at this point, you can smooth the outside a bit. We're gonna cover the edges with crumbs, so it doesn't have to be perfect. Just wanna smooth them down. And so for putting crumbs on a cake, this is generally the setup. Oh, that's cold on the bottom. All right, Ooh, that's better. So you put the cooled crumbs in a bowl and you have it over a rimmed baking sheet just to contain the mess. You take a handful of crumbs and you press it on the sides. 
So this is ice cream. Obviously it's gonna melt on you. So you wanna work pretty quickly and you should always feel free to return it to the freezer at any point if it's looking a bit soft. This is always a messy project. And sometimes, especially if you're making this for a party, you can do this part, put the crumbs on the sides and then put it back in the freezer and just decorate it right before serving. So you get all this messy bit out of the way. My daughter loves this cake. I think she likes the brownie in the bottom, but also the flavor of the cinnamon and the ice cream is just so unexpected and welcome. These crunchy cinnamon toast crunch on the sides. I mean, who doesn't love cinnamon toast crunch? All right, that looks pretty good. You know, swipe the crumbs out from this little lip in the springform pan. Some of the crumbs will wind up on the cake stand. I kind of like that look, rustic. All right, here is the cake stand. Now to get the cake off this plate, you just want to slide a nice thin spatula right underneath. Of course, there's the brownie underneath, so it's nice and easy to move right onto the cake stand. Oh, all right, now to decorate the top. This is not a fancy cake, so we're gonna decorate it with some whipped cream. Now, the recipe calls for actually whipping your own cream, and putting it in a pastry bag with a star tip, but quite frankly, we're talking brownies and ice cream and toffee bits. I'm using the stuff in the can. So we're just gonna put it around the outside. You know, it's a down-home cake, let's just keep it down home. All right, now in the center of this, we're gonna pour some chocolate syrup. The chocolate syrup will set up because the cake's nice and cold. Some of it'll drip down over the slices. So you want about half a cup of the chocolate syrup right in the middle of the cake. Oh, that quite frankly is my daughter's favorite part. All right, last but not least, some maraschino cherries, the hallmark of any good fried ice cream. Now the recipe calls for one, but I don't know, I want everyone to have one. So this cake serves, you know, yeah, 10 to 12 people. So I'm gonna give everyone a cherry. <laughs> and that is a fried ice cream cake. Now time to taste it. What kind of knife you use to cut an ice cream cake? Doesn't really matter. I like using, I mean, this is a boning knife meant for butchering meat, but I like it because it's a very narrow blade, which means less drag through the ice cream. And you can dip the knife in hot water. Helps go through the ice cream a little bit if you want to. Oh, there it is. Don't you love how the chocolate just fills in where the knife goes? It's like a chocolate lake on top. So good. <laughs> yeah, yes. Oh, that chocolate dripping down the side. That is a perfect piece of cake. It is absolutely delicious. And of course, a little cherry of whipped cream. Mmm. <laughs> Marta's gonna love this after school today. See you next time. Thanks for watching. What'd you think? Leave a comment below and let me know what you're excited to cook this week. You can get today's recipes and more for free at our website.